Barbarian here at Cleveland State, um, and I would like to welcome you to um, OpenCon 2019 Cleveland. We're really excited to have you here. This is very loud. Um, we, this is our second uh, OpenCon Cleveland event. Uh, last year we had really great feedback, and we learned a lot, so we decided to give it another try this year. So for all of you who were here last year, welcome back. And for those who are here for your first OpenCon Cleveland event, uh, I'd like to give you a hearty welcome. So um, our OpenCon 2019 Cleveland Planning Committee <laughs> um, really took seriously the task that we had to provide um, a useful and interesting selection of speakers and sessions for you today. Um, and we really want to help you legitimately move forward the open education programs that you have on your campuses, a cause that's important to all of us. So today I hope you find opportunities to think more deeply about the importance of open education, connect with colleagues who share your challenges and your enthusiasm, and leave with some concrete strategies for improving open education at your own institution. So very briefly, I just want to explain what OpenCon is. We didn't make up that word. Um, OpenCon is an international conference that celebrates open access, open data, and open education. And it caters specifically to new professionals. Um, but because it's an international event, it occurs at different places in the world every year, so not everybody can make it. So they help um, folks who want to have a satellite event plan one in their own local area. So this is an official OpenCon satellite event. Um, usually the satellite events occur during the time of the international conference, which is in November, but we really wanted to celebrate Open Education Week, which is this week. So we're focusing on open education and we're having our event um, during Open Education Week. So if this topic interests you, open education, um, I would encourage you to check out both that international open con event and also the other Open Education Week events that you can see on the Open Education Week website. All right, so um, I just want to get a sense of who all is joining us today. I'm not going to make you stand, but if you could raise your hand um, if you are a faculty member. Raise your hand. Okay. All right, pretty good. How about an instructional designer? Have any instructional designers? Wow, that's a pretty good turnout for them. How about librarians? Yes, my librarian's in the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, any administrators here? Okay, very glad that you are here. Um, students, we have students here? No, they'll be here later. <laughs> They're all in class right now. Okay, um, did I miss anybody? Any other? All right, so it seems like we have a good mix, which was our goal, so that's wonderful. Um, so while open education efforts are gaining momentum in Ohio and across the country, it's not easy. It's, it's hard. You have to, um, to devote the time and energy and resources to these projects, and sometimes it can be discouraging. So I'm hoping that this event can also be a chance to kind of cheerlead for each other and um, recognize all the hard work that we're doing. So in that spirit, uh, I think I'm going to ask for standing. If you are an author of an open educational resource, if you could stand so we can clap for you. Yes! <laughs> we <got> one person. <laughs> um, how about if you use open educational resources in your teaching, if you could stand. Come on, I know people do it. Yay! All right, um, last one, I promise. If you are directly involved in a program on your campus to promote the development and use of open educational resources, which might be a lot of people, please stand <laughs> so we can clap for you. All right. Well, thank you all for the really important work that you do, and we're going to continue celebrating that work through the day today. So before we get started with the conference itself, I want to um, cover a few housekeeping details. So first, um, we don't have any scheduled breaks for the first part of the day. So at any time, if you need to leave and um, grab a snack outside of the door or grab some coffee, caffeinate, um, please feel free to do that. Uh, the bathrooms, um, the women's restroom, if you leave and, um, out the door and take a left, it's on your left. The men's restroom, if you go out and take a right, um, it's a, and then you can hang a right, that's where that is. 
Um, if you haven't already, everybody should have gotten a little raffle ticket when you came in. So if you didn't, please let somebody know. But um, back in the, uh, against the wall over there, we have four fabulous prizes. So you can put your name on your raffle ticket and put, uh, put it in uh, one of the buckets for one of the prizes. And then we are going to draw winners for each of the prizes at the end. So you have to be present to win. And we're doing it at the end. So you see what we did there. So you've got to stay <laughs> in order to get your prize. Um, so if, if you are using social media and you would like to share about this event, uh, our hashtag is hashtag OpenCon2019Cleveland, and I think it's on your program as well. Please feel free to share uh, what, you're, what you're learning about um, as the event goes on. We're also recording most of today's sessions, and we're going to put the recordings um, on our event website later. So if you want to review anything or if you want to share this with your colleagues who couldn't make it, please feel free to check out the website later on um, and you can see those recordings. Um, finally, if you have any issues or questions during the day, you can feel free to ask one of our event uh, planning committee members. So if those folks would please stand so we can see who you are, okay? So most of us are wearing an orange pin of some kind, so, um, Thank you, you guys can sit down. So please feel free to, um, to track one of us down if you have a question or if you're lost or, um, or if you just want to know more about what Cleveland State is doing about open education, we're happy to answer your questions. All right, so with those details out of the way, I'm very excited to turn it over now to Ben Richards to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Oh, thanks. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Guawei Jian. Guawei Jian is a professor and graduate director at Cleveland State School of Communication. His research and publications focus on organizational communication and leadership. And today we are very lucky to have him give his keynote presentation on building narratives, creating conversations of change and innovation, a reflection on the adoption of OER. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Guawei Jian. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy International Women's Day. Um, I think everybody should celebrate this day. Um, actually, I, I, when I think about it, there are a lot of connections between the movement of international uh, women's rights and so on, and also to the connection with OER, if you think about it. Uh, we can, I'll, I'll explore that connection later. Um, also, I'd like to start by giving my sincere thanks to Ben and uh, Bruce Mandy uh, and the rest of the planning committee for inviting me to this great event and for their diligent work in making this happen for a second time. So congratulations. Well, when Ben and Mandy approached me last year, uh, I have to acknowledge um, I knew almost nothing about OER. And, um, you may be wondering why I accepted this invitation. Uh, well, if you have ever worked with uh, librarians at CSU, you know they're the kindest colleagues you could ever hope to have. And uh, they're the persuasive lot. And uh, how can you say no to them, right? But I do have my own personal reasons for agreeing uh, to speak today. Um, first, uh, it's a combination of personal experiences. Uh, first, as a graduate student, uh, over 20 years um, um, by now um, ago, and as a graduate student in the U.S., and then now as a professor and author and researcher in a public-funded university. Uh, well, first, uh, let me ask you, how many of you uh, have, is a, uh, I would say, frequent user of scholarly journals or have contributed research to be published in scholarly journals? Please raise your hand. Okay, a lot of you, okay. Um, well, I myself, like many of my fellow researchers, um, find the licensing arrangement uh, is a scheme doesn't seem to make a lot of sense uh, in which the public and the university who fund much of our research in the first place and have to pay for the second time. Um, so that's uh, one reason. Uh, second, how many of you are receiving emails nowadays uh, soliciting your research 
to be published in an open access journal or to serve as a reviewer or editorial, uh, editorial board member in those kinds of journals. Um, can you raise your hand? Okay, uh, many of you. Uh, I receive those emails a lot, and some of them, I have to say, seem like a uh, um, predatory scam, um, but others do seem legitimate. And I'm very curious about this uh, growing phenomenon called open access, um, but if you are like me, you know, already very busy with my research, teaching, service, I just let my curiosity slide by and made my safe uh, decisions by sending my articles to safe journals, uh, mainstream journals in my discipline, communication. Um, so I see this opportunity as a, as a way for me to start reading and learning about this. And thirdly, um, I know many of you are professors, teachers here. Uh, are there any students coming in? Just come in? Not yet? Okay. But in my classroom, I realized that no matter what I say, how I say it, uh, a large number of my students decided uh, against buying the damn expensive textbooks. Um, and I don't blame them. It's just a reality. Because when I was a graduate student 20 years ago, over 20 years ago in the US, I had a full tuition waiver, a TA stipend. I was still struggling with expenses of textbooks. And um, well, my wife is a physician. We often exchange our professional experiences. And one thing in common that we find is that um, it's like for her to prescribe a brand name medicine to her patient, which she couldn't find a replacement drug or a, a, a generic replacement. Um, but most likely, this patient couldn't afford to buy that medicine. And um, so it's a very frustrating, uh, you know, powerless experience um, with a flash of guilt. And um, nowadays, every semester, when I'm putting together my syllabus and ty typing into the words, uh, pre, um, required textbooks, and I felt I was stabbing into my own conscience because uh, um, I know some, a lot of students decided uh, not to buy those textbooks. Uh, in fact, I saw a statistic uh, in a recent survey uh, about over 2,000 students in that sample across 256 campuses in the U.S. 65% of students reported they decided against buying the, pre you know, the required textbooks. So that's very alarming because we know that students who don't have access to the textbooks, they tend to perform less effectively in the classroom. So because of those combination of experiences, when uh, ben and uh, Mandy approached me and said, uh, don't we want our students to have free textbooks? I said, hey, yes, we do. Sign me up. Uh, of course, later I realized, you know, what did I get myself into because I really don't know much about OER. So I did what I do best as a student. Uh, as many of my students, I started uh, reading the OER literature. What I found was that OER has a lot to do with change and change at various levels. It happens that my own research has to do with organizational change and leadership. As a student of human communication, um, I have long been intrigued by the question that is, if we consider organizations and society as communication systems or uh, constituted in communication processes, what can we learn about the success and failure of change in organizations? So in this learning journey, in my own learning journey of OER, I pose this question, that is, how can we understand uh, about OER or perhaps advance the movement of OER from the perspective of change, innovation, and communication? So in the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, share with you some of my tentative answers, incomplete answers uh, with you uh, in, in my own uh, learning process in the last few months. And actually, I'm very excited and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the uh, insights of my fellow presenters and speakers and also from the audience because I know many of you are practitioners of OER, authors of OER materials. So there's so much uh, for me to, to learn in the rest of the day. So hopefully this presentation will help open up our conversation. Now, as a professor, I'd like to start with definitions. Um, 
So what is open educational resources? Um, I'm assuming many of you by this point are very familiar with uh, this definition. Um, actually, I found two definitions in my review. One, I call it OER as noun, uh, referring to material, learning objects, free textbooks. Um, in fact, uh, the Hewlett Foundation offered uh, one of the widely accepted definition, here I quote, OER are teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. Open educational resources include full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software, and any other tools, materials, or techniques used to support access to knowledge. As you can see, this is a definition oriented more to the material, to the uh, objects. Uh, what I like to bring people's attention to is this second layer of meaning that is OER as verb, as practice. I like a definition proposed by a German uh, scholar, um, Wolf Daniel Ehlers. He proposed that open educational practices uh, support the reuse, production of OER through institutional policies, promote innovative pedagogical models, and respect and empower learners as co-producers on their lifelong learning path. In this definition, I found three central elements. One is student-centered learning. Second, learning through co-construction of knowledge. Third, learning through interaction and reflection. Um, I found uh, this quote by a couple of scholars, um, De Rosa and Robinson, in their article on OER. I didn't put on a slide, but I like to quote here. They said, when we think about o OER as something we do rather than something we find, adopt, acquire, we begin to tap their full potential for learning. Instead of thinking, no thinking of knowledge as something students need to download into their brains, we start thinking of knowledge as something continuously created and revised." Unquote. Scholars John Hannon and his colleagues in Australia made the argument that when we think about student-centered learning, uh, student-centeredness, uh, we shouldn't just to think about um, student satisfaction as in customer cent centeredness. Rather, as educator educators, we should pay attention to um, learning as a way um, uh, through interaction, through reflection, um, moving away from a teacher-centered dis distributive model of learning. So if we recognize OER as both a noun and a verb, we begin to, uh, to see that the you know, by focusing on each, they are, we address different kind of challenges. See, if we look at OER as now, we look at, we focus on increasing awareness, integrating our practice, uh, our textbooks, free textbooks into existing practices, or finding a sustaining model to produce OER materials. But if we focus on um, OER as a verb, we focus on pedagogical innovations, institutional support, institutional policy changes. Um, so we need to um, overcome challenges associated with both a noun and a verb in order to succeed in this endeavor. So if we look at OER as innovations, um, then what is the state of adoption of OER uh, as both innovations in the sense of material as well as in the sense of uh, practice. Well, the latest national survey that I found in my review, you may have seen um, better statistics. I'd like to listen to that afterwards. But this is what I found. That was a survey done in 2015, 2016. A national survey using a representative sample of faculty, including um, all Carnegie classifications in the U.S., two-year, four-year universities, colleges, uh, all disciplines, um, all range of faculty from um, part-time to full-time, tenured, non-tenured, tenure-track lecturers, and so on and so forth. So it's a very good representative sample. Uh, what it was found was that only 5.3% of courses 
are you were using an openly licensed required textbook. And the rate of adoption of openly licensed open stacks college textbooks for large enrollment introductory undergraduate course, courses is 10%, a little bit better. For those who are not familiar with OpenStax, it's uh, one of the key nonprofit uh, distributors of open textbooks based in Rice University in Texas. Well, if you look at these statistics, they are actually about OER as a noun. Uh, I would assume that if the survey looked at OER as verb, as practice, the numbers would be much lower, right? Um, so how do we interpret these numbers within the larger trajectory of innovation adoption? To understand that, I'd like to introduce a uh, concept called innovation diffusion or innovation adoption S-curve. Um, that is, most um, innovation adoptions follow, researchers found that um, they follow a normal uh, bell-shaped curve of distribution as indicated, as indicated here. And you will see that uh, there are about 16% in the population or of the total uh, adoptions happen um, at the beginning, at the end, and the majority, 60 uh, eight percent, uh, including the early majority and late majority. And it, this is plotted over time on the basis of frequency, but if we plot it over time on the basis of uh, cumulative numbers, we got this orange or green colored um, S-shaped curve you see there. And you'll notice that at the beginning, the early stage of adoption, uh, we have a slow rise in the curve. Um, at around 10%, to 20%, there exists a takeoff point, or we call it a tipping point. Um, so after that point, the adoption takes off, okay? A critical mass starts to accumulate. A critical mass refers to, you know, there's enough number of adoptions in the system so that further rate of adoption becomes self-sustaining, according to Everett Rogers, a well-known scholar in uh, innovation diffusion. So if you recall the num, the num oh, excuse me, going back a little bit. If you recall these numbers that I cited, you can see that they are still away from that tipping point. Uh, we still have uh, a, a pretty, um, uh, some distance uh, to climb in order to reach the takeoff point. So the next question becomes, you know, what prevents us from reaching that tipping point or takeoff point? So by reviewing our literature, this OER literature, I did some kind of qualitative um, content analysis um, and I found there are three kinds of barriers in general. There are many different factors, but I put them into these three barriers. And the first one, I, I like this quote um, from uh, the surveys and studies, that is uh, the sentiment or the attitude from the faculty is the status quo seems to be working. Um, so why OER, uh, why change, right? As I mentioned earlier in medicine, doctors prescribe uh, medicine for which the patients have to pay. In education, professors prescribe textbooks their students have to pay for. Um, so it's the students who feel the pain, the dissatisfaction directly, most acutely, but not the professors. Um, organizational change literature tells us that unless there's sufficient amount of pain and dissatisfaction felt by the main constituencies, People would resist change or do nothing, okay? Now, knowledge is another set of barriers that I found. They have to do with uh, lack of knowledge, misunderstanding, lack of discoverability. Well, in, a, in the same study I cited earlier, they found also that there, are, there were only 6.6% of faculty reported they were very aware of OER materials. Uh, around 19%, less than 20% saying they were aware. Um, actually, I, was, I belonged to that 80% who uh, were not aware until a few months ago. Um, this is aggravated by the misunderstandings of OER. And for instance, OER somehow is 
connected to low quality in content because simply because it is free. Or OER is meant to replace face-to-face -face interaction in classroom, which we know is incorrect. Um, also, the report of lack of discoverability, this lack of open or uh, common repositories for OER materials, uh, the decentralized nature of OER materials uh, that are existing, hard for faculty members, educators to, uh, to access. So they have to do with knowledge. And the third set of barriers I found is about lack of institutional support and policies. Um, a symptom of that is the report of lack of time to engage with OER materials reported by faculty, teachers, professors. And in fact, um, a study by OpenStax uh, showed that faculty who took advantage of OER materials were not the faculty who needed most the open accessible materials. Faculty who used OpenStax books uh, were, were actually the faculty who reported they had more time in their teaching schedule to engage with OER materials. So that suggests to us that there has to be some policy changes, policy support at the institutional level, which I'll get back to later. So these are the three main um, barriers that I uncovered. Then the next question becomes, you know, what can we do about it? How can we create change. As a student of communication, I do believe that we can create and initiate change through communication. But that has to start with a different understanding of communication. Our common understanding of communication is to see communication as a mechanical process that is about the transmission of information from person A to person B, right? Uh, well, what I'm trying to um, articulate here is to see communication as the creation, sharing, and negotiation of meaning. That is the construction of social reality. If you think about change is about creating a new social reality. And that can happen through our conversations, through our narratives that we co-create together. I like to use the uh, biological metaphor. If we think about organizations and society, um, if we think of them as uh, a human body, a biological system, conversations would be like the capillaries, uh, the micro blood vessels that connect different tissues. And narratives are the ones that flow through conversations like blood, carries oxygen that sustains and transforms life, uh, the life of organizations and society. Um, management scholar uh, John Schotter argued that a change agent is a practical author of impactful conversations and narratives. In his book, Conversational Realities, he quoted uh, Vinograd and Flores, which I quote here, the most essential responsibilities for managers can be characterized as participation in conversations for possibilities that open new backgrounds for the conversations for action. Here, although they reference managers, I would say that they apply to all agents of change in all contexts of change. Now, if conversations and narratives are important, what kind of conversations that are essential for intentional change initiated to be successful in organizations? According to organizational change scholars Jeffrey Ford and Laurie Ford, there are actually four kinds of conversations an organization has to have. First, the initiative conversation aimed at introducing a new vision. Second, conversations of understanding which are aimed to develop a deeper understanding of the situation, of um, our assumptions, to develop a common language, a shared context, as well as the conditions of satisfaction for the future. And the third kind of conversations, they call it conversations of performance. That is to evaluate our performance against the conditions of satisfaction. And finally, conversations of closure, which refers to the conversations we use to celebrate the new and the success, and also to mark a clear disengagement from the past. So 
missing any one of those conversations, uh, a change, an intentional change initiative tends to uh, fail or to be derailed by uh, resistance. So um, a communication scholar, Walter Fisher, once famously declared that human beings are homo narrans, uh, meaning human beings are storytelling animals. They are different in the sense that we as human beings, we like stories. We like to use stories to um, memorize things. We use stories to make sense of, of our social world. We use stories to make decisions together. And we use narratives to predict our future. Um, so at the center of the stories we tell is this idea of narrative logic, uh, which is in contrast to the rational scientific logic that we as uh, scientists, researchers, or educators are more familiar with. But studies of human communication tell us that human beings um, tend to be persuaded by the narrative logic than the scientific logic. And the scientific logic, scientific evidence alone is not necessary to change human behavior and human attitude. So it doesn't mean that we, have to, we need to exclude scientific evidence or scientific logic. Rather, we should include them to make a better story to move people in the change process. So knowing the importance of conversation and narrative, what can we do? Uh, what kind of specific kinds of conversations, narratives, we need to have in order to make change in the context of OER? So, what I'm proposing here uh, are three streams of conversations and narratives, from local to organizational to institutional or global. They are mutually uh, reinforcing. They are inter uh, interwoven uh, to drive change. So I'll start with the local streams of conversations and narratives. What I mean by local, I'm referring to the routine conversations we carry out with our colleagues in the department, with our librarians, instructional designers, and so on. So the purpose is to spread the knowledge of OER and to drive OER-related pedagogical innovations and research in our day-to-day -day academic activities. Um, these kinds of conversations can take many different forms. Uh, we can form communities of practice. We can form departmental committees uh, or even uh, informal gatherings. Uh, as an example, in a university in Canada called the Kwantlen Polytech University. Uh, as far as I know, that's the only polytech university in Canada. In January 2016, uh, KPU became the first institution uh, in British Columbia, in Canada, to have over 100 courses to adopt open textbooks and to achieve a saving of over $200,000 for their students. That achievement started two years earlier at a informal faculty gathering at one of the faculty members' home with coffee and cake. And that conversation led to the formation of a departmental committee in the following semester, which then led to a conf some conference presentations and then eventually course adoptions, the result, the outcomes. So as you can see, conversations do or did open up possibilities. And we can use conversations to drive those possibilities into reality. Now, we can also use conversations to create alliance among constituencies. If you think about o OER, in, uh, OER initiative, it's very complex. We have to include faculty, students, librarians, copyright officers, bookstore, accessibility services, financial aid, IT, and e-learning, etc. So there are many, many players in this. We have to form alliance with all the players in order to move forward. As a researcher, from a research perspective, I see endless possibilities for research and innovation. Um, because Simply because OER is new, there's so much we don't know about how teachers, professors, students adapt to a student-centered learning uh, process. 
and how do we evaluate the outcome, right? How do we compare with the existing performance and processes? And so there are so much learn, uh, research possibilities and we can create, we should create opportunities for dialogue, conversation across interdepartmental, uh, across the departmental lines. And I do see librarians um, Instructional des designers, for instance, they occupy a very important role um, according to the innovation adoption literature. They are the boundary spanners. They can bridge people from the traditional departmental lines to make conversations happen. Um, so they are, they are very important players uh, in this kind of interdepartmental collaboration. So that's the local stream of conversations and narrative. Um, at the organizational level, organizational stream of conversations and narratives, if you recall, um, lack of institutional support and policies was cited as one of the major uh, barriers to adoption. So that means that uh, we have to drive policy changes at the university level. Well, we know firsthand that uh, in universities, the policies in assessment in tenure uh, determinations, in appointment, they determine a great deal how faculty members, educators use their time, effort, uh, in, in, you know, in order to balance teaching, research, and service, right? So in order to make policy changes, we have to initiate conversations with our administrators. Well, some, a lot of research cited lack of awareness by faculty as the major barrier to OER adoption, I would argue that the lack of awareness by administrators is equally, if not more, important. So how do we engage administrators in this conversation? Now, we need to align our local narratives vertically with institutional organizational narratives. Um, in a sense, to align them with universities' missions, college missions, strategic goals. I use the example of um, CSU, for instance. The first part of our mission statement at CSU is this, I quote, our mission is to encourage excellence, diversity, and engaged learning by providing a contemporary and accessible education in the arts, sciences, humanities, and professions. I would argue we need to craft a narrative to articulate why OER or OER-related initiatives can advance engaged learning, can significantly enhance the accessibility of knowledge to our students, and ultimately to achieve excellence. This is not about hitting the right buzzwords. This is about collective sense-making. This is about um, vertically imbricating our local narrative with the organizational, institutional narratives in order to create the momentum for change at the organizational level. Another example uh, could be that, you know, we often cite how much money we can save for our students uh, by adopting OER materials. Um, as champions of OER, we have to think about, you know, how much money we can save uh, for the institution, for the organization. So what, what is the organizational benefit? What is the organizational cost saving beyond the savings for our students? So if we don't know these numbers, I think we have the obligation to find them out, right? And lastly, uh, we have to formulate university level OER vision, strategy, and policies. Uh, I saw the panel uh, for the pre-conference. Uh, you know, I apologize, I couldn't be there. I saw some you know, initiative has already been done toward this direction because to scale up OER, uh, as to build OER infrastructure, we need uh, university level visions. And because we need, you know, for instance, to implement support system, to build a support system, uh, to implement copyright intellectual property policies, to develop our open repository, we need a institutional infrastructure to do that. So that university level vision is critical. Now, at the global level, um, we must recognize that our university is not alone. U.S. is not alone. This is really a global initiative. Um, 
including both developing and developed countries, ranging from Asia to Africa to Oceania to Europe to America, then the question is, what, what is behind? What connects us? What connects us? What's driving? What's the driving force behind this global initiative? Well, I like to say that what connects us is the word free, uh, although not just the free textbooks. We know we all like free stuff, but I, we also know that uh, you know, there's no free lunch, right? Um, but I would argue that, that free is in the word freedom. As Derek Keats, uh, the champion and advocate of OER in South Africa, eloquently said that OER is inherently about the freedom to pursue knowledge. Okay. It is about addressing social inequality, so um, educational inequality. Earlier I said that there is a connection between international women's rights and movement. Uh, that connection is here. It's, it, they're connected in the sense that they're all about social injustice, social inequality. Um, so we have, we have OER as an opportunity to leverage the newly uh, emerging information technologies and also the, a new kind of information economy. And this kind of information economy is what the Harvard Law Professor um, Yukai Bankler called networked information economy, uh, which is drastically different from the industrial information economy in which we have been operating within for about over a century. In the industrial information economy, to reap the benefit of knowledge created by individuals, academics, we need a commercial market. We need industrial production in order to realize that, the benefits. But in the newly emerging network information economy, a non-market production process of knowledge and information is emerging, allowing a direct relationship between you and me as creators of knowledge and the public who fund and benefits from such knowledge. And that's a fundamental change. That's a fundamental change, and that gives us unprecedented opportunity to advance social you know, justice, the causes like social justice, and to uh, change the reality in terms of educational inequality. In order to make those changes, we have to think about public policies and uh, uh, the decisions uh, we made at the governmental level. Um, according to uh, Cable Green, the director of Open Education at Creative Commons, he wrote, Federal and state governments and um, education systems all play a critical role in setting policies that drive education investments and have an interest in ensuring that public funding of education makes a meaningful, cost-effective contribution to socioeconomic development. Policy-making entities are ideally positioned to require recipients of public funding to produce educational resources under an open license. So we have to initiate and participate in conversations with our policymakers, where, with our lawmakers, to drive such policy changes. Um, so to end my presentation, I'd like to challenge our audience here to take this conversation among colleagues between you and me um, here and now to those who couldn't be here today um, to a colleague of yours, a colleague in your department, uh, your students, your chair and dean in the next week or next month. And uh, I believe that uh, our conversations will catch on, our narratives will turn into innovations, and we will make educational equality as a reality. Thank you very much. Well, I welcome questions, um, discussions, thoughts. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Natalie. I'm a personal um, I was really struck by... Oh, hi. Oh, look at that. Hello. Um, 
Yes, I'm, I'm a teacher. This is my teacher voice. Um, I, was, I was struck by your comments about freedom, and the thing that I immediately thought of was this conversation I had with my 13-year-old mm -hmm. uh, son on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. He was asking me, he said, in school we were learning about the Crusades, and he, I'm a theology teacher, so mm -hmm. he's checking his school knowledge against my presumed expertise. And everything I said to him, I noticed he was in the back with his phone, like fact-checking me as well. <laughs> and I realized, and I noticed this with some of my younger students now, that, that my, like, I have to free up my own sense of self as sort of knowledge bearer or something like that. And it's a really kind of strange sort of psychological space to sit in as people who are trained to be experts and all of this to kind right. of Right. sort of be different with and there's a kind of freeing in that for the learner as well as for the self and it's really I mean I love this idea of the sort of shifting conversation because it really is creating a whole different mm -hmm. kind of paradigm for thinking about how we know truth and how we arrive at it so Absolutely. it was another layer to that that I I was just I was brought back to that conversation and I thought wow I really have to be careful anymore I'm gonna lose like total credibility with my kids so but thank you so much for your talk it was Absolutely. great yeah thank you for a comment that's a, that's a very uh, good insight um, actually you know 20 years ago when I was in graduate school uh, we were reading about postmodernism, right? In postmodernism, if you are familiar with the concept, in a postmodern world, uh, there's no central authority. Authority is dead, okay? Uh, authority is constantly challenged, okay? The ideal authority is, has to be negotiated constantly. Um, so 20 years later now, I would say we're in a postmodern world already. Uh, Everything in our surroundings, uh, the idea of fake news, right? Uh, it's about challenging the journalistic authority. We use, don't doubt at all, right? Uh, mostly, right? Now we doubt about it. Um, so this idea of truth is no longer um, uh, consecrated in a textbook or in a person being, you know, identity of a professor. No, people can check on the information. So. The idea of we as professors just giving out knowledge, imparting knowledge, is no longer our role. Our role is really about how do we reflect about knowledge? Can we co-create knowledge together, right? Uh, that's the future, that's the 20th century, 21st century model of learning. So if we are still stuck in the 20, 20th century industrial model, then you know, we'll be dead in, in 100 years. You know? People will wake up and say, what is a professor? You know, Because <laughs> um, we'll become irrelevant. And, and uh, I welcome your comment. That's a very good one. Go ahead. Problem. So in the organizational connection you made, yeah. one of the things that you recommended that we do is collaborate with our bookstores. Yeah. Do you have some suggested strategies for how to do that? This morning we had a conversation about how for a lot of faculty, mm -hmm. agreements the university makes with the bookstores are actually in violation of our academic freedom. We are forced to promote the bookstore uh -huh. Uh -huh. in lieu of all other resources uh -huh. when we would like to use OERs. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how we would go about collaborating with an institution that doesn't have the same idea of OERs as we do. Right. Um, thank you very much for the question. I have to say, I have to be honest, I, I, don't, have ex I don't have experience um, to, to suggest you know, how to a um, how do we incorporate uh, uh, bookstore? As I, as I told you, that I'm very new in this uh, uh, endeavor. Um, but I do, I can see that uh, if we find a way to create an uh, opportunity to have a dialogue, okay, to have a conversation, um, and the dynamic will change. As soon as we sit down with another individual, uh, it's very different. Uh, from uh, sending an email back and forth. And that kind of empathy that is going on in an in, you know, interpersonal conversation um, environment can totally change the energy that is going on between two departments. So um, I, um, I'm actually curious about how we at CSU is going to do or is already doing, I'm not sure. Um, uh, you know, I like to see how that, that kind of conversation can be initiated and carried out and making progress over time. So um, 
as I said, you know, I want to be a learner of how that process goes. But if anyone here has some knowledge about, you know, can answer some of the questions that uh, uh, our audience member has raised, feel free to stand up and, and join in the conversation. Anyone would like to comment on that question? No? Okay, we can talk more later today, of course, but thank you for that question. I'm sure Mandy has written down that question to talk about later. Anyone? I just had a short comment, or a question, actually. Sure. Has the bookstore been engaged with the committees here already and gotten their thoughts and input and had conversations yet with, with them? So your question is about here at CSU. Yeah, so, and I don't know if all of you have experience, but it's a good idea to involve the bookstore in conversations about OER. Clearly it impacts them, and we are very lucky here in that our bookstore is open to the idea of using open textbooks, and they're supportive of it. Um, and I think a lot of bookstores see their role as um, both selling things and also um, supporting our students' success. Um, so, but I think the experience, I mean, it varies greatly. So I don't know if anybody else has um, an experience at your own institution with a bookstore not wanting to, you know, engage with open. This is definitely something we can chat about later in the day. Mm -hmm. And kind of because it is a challenge mm -hmm. it's a challenge mm -hmm. but I really like the idea of sitting down and having a narrative with a conversation right. I think that can really help right right yeah thank you um, so when you were talking about um, innovation the innovation curve for mm -hmm. this one of the barriers that strikes out to me is the, the changing nature of labor within academia. Mm -hmm. So as we see increasing numbers of adjunct professors yeah. with even less time yeah. that we're uh, given to do things like class prep. And so we end up in these positions where if it isn't already in, out there and created, it's very hard to engage with it. And so I think if we want, I, I think the conditions of labor in academia mm -hmm. and the conditions for things like OER are actually intertwined. And as we're having Absolutely. those conversations, yeah. I, I, you know, it just struck me when you said that, that, that right. these are connected. Yeah. And if we want to make space for OER, we have to make space for all the types of labor that we do as educators. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Uh, I think, um, and I, every department has a different culture and different arrangement, uh, oversight over the uh, performance of adjunct and their their uh, procedures for them to adopt to adopt their textbooks and so on and so forth. So, uh, in order to make uh, to make those kinds of changes, we really have to look at our local contexts. Uh, also within the broader labor conditions that is going on in our society. Um, so they're, 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 they're connected uh, intricately um, and um, uh, it, it's a very um, um, convoluted and complex, very complex process. From the qualitative studies I have seen, uh, there was a 19, uh, 2017 article uh, by the last names of the authors are Cox and Trotter. Uh, it's in the bibliography um, that I have included in my presentation, uh, Cox and Charter. Uh, in their article, in their study, they studied three Afri South African universities. Um, and each university has a very different uh, local culture. And um, so the study explored, you know, how the situational fa uh, factors impact the OER adoption in their universities. Um, it's a very fascinating study, very detailed study. It, it, it shows um, uh, the, the complexity that you have mentioned uh, um, at different levels, personal, institutional, and societal levels. So uh, that's why we need a wide range of players at, table, at the table uh, you know, in order to move this forward. By just having tenure track faculty, I don't think, you know, this is going to be very successful. By just having uh, librarians, I don't think that can, you know, um, you know make, make it successful in the long term. Um, but thank you for your comments.
comment. Uh, any other questions? Ben, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. So if you read the bio, uh, Dr. Gian does consulting with organizations as well. And I wonder if you have any, without getting into too much detail, either like toolkits or just methods to arrive at that, you said collective sense making. Mm -hmm. And that stuck out to me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's easier to sit down with an individual and have those conversations mm -hmm. and kind of come to some common mm -hmm. understanding, but how do you do that within a larger organization? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. I, I think uh, when we, we have to, you remember that S curve, the in, I go back here, if you look at to that innovation S curve there, um, depending on where we are in the adoption process, the strategies may, may be different, okay? Um, it's clear that OER adoption is still at early stage. Um, so in order to make change, um, one suggestion that I found very um, helpful, could be very helpful, is from an uh, article written by Fahad uh, Dastour, um, um, who is a scholar and champion of OER um, in British Columbia in Canada, he said, uh, we can make changes by forming committees, okay? But when we form committees, we have to be very careful because we know as academics, um, we know the term death by committee, right? Uh, committees are very, you know, notoriously for killing great ideas. But if you look at the distribution of adopters of an innovation, there are six, the good news is there are 16% of the population of adopters are early adopters, innovators, okay? So if you are a champion in your, in your department, you want to form a, department, a, a departmental committee, okay? You have to think very carefully who to include in this committee. You want to find that 16% of your colleagues who are willing to take risks, who are interested in new stuff, okay? And so populate your committee with innovators uh, is a good strategy to have the conversation going to create the momentum that is needed in this early stage. Um, so uh, instead of including laggards in your committee, which will ensure the death of, uh, of your idea. Um, so that, that's a concrete, I would say, a concrete strategy uh, that I like um, to pursue uh, in the future if, if you want to start something in your department, in your university. Uh, I hope that answers part of your question. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. So we are going to now kind of take some time to discuss amongst ourselves and digest a little bit. I just need to pull up my slides, our slides, it's actually Mandy's slide. Um, so with one or two or even three people around you, um, it would be great if you could talk with someone new. Uh, we'd like to ask you to now sort of unpack some of what you heard from Dr. Gian um, and just a couple ideas, conversation starters that you can see on the screen. Um, if you want to think about which strategy layers or streams would be maybe most impactful at your organization currently. Um, and then also thinking about what sort of stories are you trying to tell, what sort of narratives are you trying to tell, um, what's working on your campus, um, and if things are not working as well as you would like them, um, what resources or tools do you need to communicate those narratives that you want to share? Um, so we have probably around 10 minutes to talk amongst yourselves, and then we'll take a short break, and then we'll come back for our 11 o'clock 
um, session. Okay. We'll start our next session, so if you do want to step out, now is a great time to do so.